everybody. So glad you could join us as Arnie and I continue to welcome amazing guests for this very special Maccabi USA Sports Show. We've been at, at this for you know, it's quite some time now, Arnie. Yeah, right? Hey, we've been at it for, what, three months? Four months already. Four months. I mean, like, Nance, I'm just telling you, whoever comes on and watches me and Arnie, they are recruiting us. We are heavy recruitment to, like, take this show to the next level. I don't know if ESPN's ready for us, but I think it's become clear that all of us gather for the great guests the great conversation, but it's important to say it's that feeling of connectedness that we all feel around something bigger than ourselves, and that is building Jewish pride through sports. This was an incredible week in sports, one where issues and standings for something larger than ourselves was front and center, and I am sure, Nancy and Arnie, we will discuss the biggest play in sports initiated by the Milwaukee Bucks during this evening together. Athletes ex exercising their voices, refusing to just shut up and dribble or serve or pitch, but instead go to bat for a greater good. It's interesting if you follow Twitter, um, it's troubling for some, but for others, it's a real sea change in the way athletes can express themselves and actually stand up in our society as full members of our society. And I know my friend Nancy will have something to say about that. As Jews, who are facing the greatest rise of anti-Semitism since World War II, what is our responsibility? Because we too have a power of sports and it gives us things to think about every single day. Mostly I'm glad that you're all here. I am thrilled that our friend Nancy Lieberman, I have to say Arnie and I know Nancy for a long, long time. Um, she's never been shy about making a statement both on the basketball court and off. Right, Nance? Uh, let me just talk, I, I, listen, her, her, her um, her personal highlights are so long, but I edited these in a certain way. See if you get the theme. Nancy was the first two-time National Player of the Year in women's college basketball. I happened to play against her several of those years, by the way. She is the first draft pick in the inaugural draft of the first U.S. Uh, US women's Professional Basketball League in 1981, the WBL. She was the first woman to play in a men's professional basketball league. You get the idea? She was the first woman of age 50, and I think I was the commissioner the, uh, the, when you did this, when she signed a seven-day contract and played for the Detroit Shock. I thought that was spectacular. First GM and head coach of the WNBA's Detroit Shock in 1998. She was the first female head coach to lead an NBA or NBA Development League team when she led the Dallas Mavericks D-League team, the Legends, I remember that. First female head coach to win a championship title in a men's professional league, the uh, 2018, I watched that actually game, Big Three League, and the first female head coach in a men's professional league for team power in the big league. But I also, you know, the, oh, all right, you were the, the first assistant coach, female assistant, no, 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 the second female assistant, assistant coach, because you, you were with the Kings. She's a Hall of Famer, a two-time Olympian. Um, she's amazing, and she's Nancy Lieberman. Thanks, Nance. Well, more importantly, uh, I've known you since I was uh, 15, 16 years old. So we go back a long time and the things that you've done in, in your life and your career are, are just as worthy of those nice things that you said about me because you've oh, created a, a path. You've been the commissioner of the WNBA. Uh, you, your business acumen, what you've meant to women and, and quite frankly to men around the world. So I'm on this call because of you and obviously Arnie, uh, in my days with the, the NBRPA, the Retired Players Association, when Arnie, uh, you know, I think an oldest bird song had me, you know, asked me if I would be on the board. They never had women before. So I, I applaud both of you for doing that. So thank That's you. That's awesome. That is truly awesome. So Arnie, Arnie always likes to start with the first question, Nance, and I'm always happy to let men go first. So there you go, Arnie. All right. Well, thanks, Donna. It's, uh, and Nancy, it's absolutely wonderful to be with you. I, I just want to tell two quick things about Nancy in terms of my involvement with her. Um, she probably doesn't remember the first one, but I, I was a 33-year-old, had black hair back then, and I was the commissioner of the last all-female Division I conference. And I picked up the phone one day. We had, a, we had an event in Chicago, and I said, let's go for the stars. And I called Nancy out of the blue. She didn't even know who I was. And I said, Nancy, I don't have much money. Would you be willing to come and say a few words uh, to, uh, to the young women that were part of our conference? And uh, Nancy, without hesitation, said yes, came to Chicago. And I've been an admirer since. And as she alluded to about seven years ago, I guess, 
uh, we were in a meeting in Las Vegas. Uh, Otis Birdsong, I think everybody knows that name, a great NBA player, was the chairman of the board, and I was the CEO of the retired players. And we very much wanted to bring the WNBA former players into the fold of the, of the NBRPA. And we ultimately did that, and we needed a great board of director. And uh, we reached out to Nancy and said, Nancy, would you be willing to be our first to represent not just the females for the WNBA, but to represent the entire uh, universe of former players? And uh, Nancy accepted and did an amazing job. So Nancy, thank you for everything you've done. Um, I, I have to tell you, you know, I was trying to think, what would I ask, to ask you as a first question? There is so much we're going to go over, hopefully, tonight. So I'm going to ask you a softball and let you answer it. You have accomplished everything from a player, as a coach, a media member, a philanthropist, um, uh, a business executive. I mean, we'll go on and on, and hopefully we can touch on some of it tonight. But if you had to pick one thing in your professional life, can you identify the thing that you're most proud of? Well, uh, thanks for uh, bringing all those moments up. But uh, clearly, playing for America is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, you know, being on the 76 Olympic team and then being on the 80 team, we had the boycott. Uh, ironically, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and America came to their rescue. You know, I always wanted to ask Bin Laden. Actually, I wanted to, to meet Bin Laden. I wanted to ask him, why do you hate America? We, we, I didn't get to do what... I did best because we, you know, made a decision through our president to boycott the Olympics in 80. What is it that we didn't do? You know, we protected you, we built your infrastructure, your schools, your banks, your, just everything, your military. What is it that we, we didn't, you know, do that wasn't pleasing to you? I would, I wish I could have had that conversation, but uh, being an Olympian, um, you know, standing for the flag and my hand over my heart, that will never change. Pretty cool, right? I have to say, Nance, I, you know, we were at the same Olympic trials. I, that's when I first met you. That's, you were 15. And uh, we both made it to the very last cut. And um, they announced you, and they didn't announce me. And I'm like, who is this kid? Little did I know that I'd have a lifetime with this kid, right? It was um, crazy. It was you crazy. Know, I actually wanted you to come play for our school, but you went to Old Dominion. I don't know. Um, and you changed, I mean, you won two championships there. You led them to two, like from nothing to two championships. It was a time on the cusp of Title IX, right? Um, compared where you were with ODU, compared to what is happening now in collegiate sports, how would you compare it? Well, it was different. See, I was actually going to go to Queens College, but look, our backgrounds, and Lucille Cavallis knows this, I, I wanted to go to Queens College, but you know, maybe you do, you know, I, I, I was a poor, poor kid growing up in, in Far Rockaway. You know, I had no father. We had no food. We had no electricity at times, no heat. And we were one grandparent away from food stamps. And I needed, I was angry. You know, the times we played against each other. Yes, I was I angry. I, I didn't remember. play. I tried to annihilate people. I was, you know, it's funny because Kobe, in our 20-year relationship, he used to call me the mama mamba. And because he's like, you're not afraid. I said, no, I, I'm, I'm not afraid. And I grew up playing angry and taking it out on people like yourself. And quite frankly, whoever I played against. But I didn't want to tell anybody because I was embarrassed because of my, my circumstances. So I, I really knew that I needed to get out of New York City. And, you know, I was lucky because of going to those Olympic and USA tryouts, the coaches were already there. I didn't have to visit campuses. So I had over 100 scholarship offers. And the one thing that I was always asked, like, what was your record last year? You know, UCLA had just made it to the finals and won a championship. Montclair State was playing, Delta State, UCLA, uh, Immaculata. And when I went and talked to Old Dominion, they were like six and 28 the year before. And I was like, you were six and 28. I want to go to your school. And everybody looked at me like, what is wrong with you? Because I always felt like I was the underdog. You know, these are so many of the Nancy Camp moments of, of my career that fueled me. I wanted to go to a school that nobody had ever heard of, that I could put my thumbprint on that, whatever that thumbprint was going to be. And, and for us to 
to go 125, you know, and 14 in, you know, in, in four years. And we won the NIT and you said we won back to back national championships. I was really proud of that because everybody said I couldn't do it. Everybody it was said it was not do it. And you did, and you did. I will say this, this is a very cathartic moment for me, Nance, because I remember it's my whole life and we've never talked about this, right? All right, we're playing at Queens College, ODU, Queens College. It's a very tight game. There's a breakaway. You're bringing the ball down on the left side. It's you on me, and you know what you did. I still, to this day, remember it. So it brings the ball up for all your basketball players, right? Brings the ball up, takes this elbow on the inside. It's hidden and goes, wham, right in my chest. And I'm like, I can't believe she did that. I still can't believe you did that. I don't remember if you scored because I was probably on the floor crying. No, I wasn't. But like Did Donna Sims didn't pick you up. <laughs> <That is that>. <laughs> <laughs> no, Artie. <laughs> we never got to talk about that. But I swear to this day, I'm like, oh my god, this is the dirtiest player I've ever seen. <laughs> and, and I was, and I, I was no shaking Violet. I, I was no. You're not wrong. Violet. You're not wrong because I, like I said, I mean, after having played in Rucker Park and guys kicking the crap out of me. And, you know, getting my nose broken and I, I was, it's just, it's how the game is played today. It's how you see the NBA players today. It was just so far ahead of its time from the cookies and milk where after a game, I remember we were playing uh, Matt, uh, James Madison with Betty James. Yep. And yeah, our, our coach, my freshman year says, well, after the game, we're going to go up and have some like uh, donuts and drinks with the other team. Like, and I'm like, I'm not going up there with the other team. <laughs> I mean, it was like, why would I go up and have a kumbaya like cookies and milk? It, it wasn't how I, I viewed uh, the game. But you know, let me tell you what happened. When we played in Madison Square Garden against you guys, I think you, you might have still been there. when we Because we played you guys uh, twice in the garden. And um, one of your teammates told the press that I, it might have been my junior year, they said she's overrated. I was so angry that she said I was overrated. It had to be Gail. It had to be Gail. Go ahead. It wasn't Gail Marquis because Gail was my team, my, my roommate on the Olympic team in 76. It was right. somebody else. I don't even think it was Althea or Gwen, but somebody said that. I was angry one time at Marianne Stanley, my, my new coach for three years. One time of all the coaches that ever coached me, because we were up by about 50 points. I think we won like 102 to 50. And we were up with about nine, 10 minutes to go. And I could have had a quadruple double. I never cared about stats or anything. So we win the game and it was, you can go back and look, but it was like 33 points and 15 rebounds and 14 assists and seven steals. I was so and Marianne took me out of the game. And I wanted to break Carol Blazjowski's Madison Square Garden. Square yeah, I, I, I actually guarded her when she had that record, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we went in the press conference. And I, you know, at the time, I didn't have like conflict resolution. And I went, I'm sorry, did, do you want to ask me a question, anybody, about being overrated? And the gal from your team came into the press conference and apologized. Well, that's amazing. It was, uh, yeah, it was. I mean, you didn't have to set me off. I mean, I was already there. Where's Jill Ozer? See, Jill, all these things, they still, they come back, and then you got to talk about them. Go ahead, Arnie, take it from here. All right, well, that, so speaking of that competitiveness, Nancy, let's, let me bring you back to your youth just a little bit. Uh, you, you were described as, the, as that young, skinny, red-headed Jewish girl from Queens. That's how, that's how uh, different media have described you before. But talk, talk a little bit, if you would, about your, your upbringing, your parents, their, what they felt about basketball. And then I'd love to, I'm sure everybody here would love to hear a little bit about your, your Jewish faith and background. I, I know your grandparents uh, were, were survivors. And just, just the impact all of that had on you as you were growing up and to, and to today. Well, uh, you know, I, I think that um, the Jewish community is a very proud community. My, um, my, mo my father's grandparents, my, my grandparents were Bubby and Zadie. My mother's grandparents were grandma and grandpa. I mean, my Bubby would have, you know, the plates 
for meat, the plates for milk, you know, not, I mean, it, it, and the one thing like they used to tell me more from my father's side was about the Holocaust. And I, it was just hard to, to grasp uh, that their parents or grandparents, you know, had been killed. You know, I think one of them were killed, burnt alive in the ovens, and the other one was in a gas chamber. And it's hard to kind of, you know, wrap your mind around that. And, you know, I went to Hebrew school. Um, again, I will continue to say I was not happy with anything, not piano less. They were trying to get me to do things I really didn't want to do. All I really wanted to do was play basketball because I needed basketball, football, baseball more than it needed me. But it was an outlet for my self-esteem and my confidence. But, uh, you know, my family, especially my dad, uh, they, every holiday, the had a lot because uh, you know it was just a Shabbat dinner it's just things that was very natural on that side not as much on my mom's side but you know Bubby and Zadie would always tell me about you know what happened you know um, with the family and you know then you know you, you fast forward and, you know, it's funny, like when I was in college, you know, they used to call me super Jew or leave the heap. I mean, God forbid you use those words today and people would fall out. You can't do that. You know, uh, you can call me anything you want to call me. It didn't bother me. It was almost in reverence to how hard I played uh, the game. And it was a compliment. It wasn't anything derogatory. Oh. But when TJ, you know, when my son signed to play in Israel three years ago, that was a, a pretty seminal moment for me to, to see him go there, understand the culture, you know, just uh, take that pride that the Jewish community has. And, and then when I went over there, I've been over about four, four times. Gary, Gary Wart knows this because his uh, son is a great player over there, Travis. To be able to see, you know, have dinner that time uh, with, you know, Travis and, you know, Gary and the family and, just to see the friendship that they've created. It's, it's really enormous, uh, to be quite honest. Um, I'm sad he's not going back. He, he's signed with the team in Italy. Um, but those three years, I mean, people would go, go oh, your son, he's the, he's the prince of Halon. He's the prince. <laughs> okay. Uh, they loved him, and he was like the, the mayor. He walks around Tel Aviv. People would stop their car and blow the horn and go, TJ Klein, TJ Klein. They could give a rat's behind about me. But TJ had an immense um, effect on the people in, in that Tel Aviv area and the friendships he's made. And I'm really proud uh, that, you know, he comes home and he talks about Shabbat dinner and all the uh, different uh, holidays that he spent that, you know, he probably didn't have in, in, in my marriage, you know, with TJ, just, you know, we, we really didn't do a lot of that, honestly. But, you know, he was on a BBYO and Mark Cuban did, you know, BBYO and uh, they have that like hour call and TJ was the guest in June after Mark Cuban. So he has such an incredible following in the Jewish community. I'm really proud of him. That's awesome. It makes me, it made Rini very proud, right? Rini is 91 oh my and God. she's very proud. God bless right? her. Right? Rini's, by the way, Nancy's mom, <clears throat> who was a huge fan. She was a huge fan. Right? She Always. Did. I know. You're still mad at her. Don't be mad at her, but give her uh, give up on that. Hey, hey, Donna, Donna. Yeah. Before you ask the question, since you mentioned Nancy's mom, yeah. I gotta ask Nancy this story because I read it. It's true. Yeah, your your mom met Muhammad Ali and said what? Said, my daughter is the greatest. I think that's some words like that. And 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 what did what did the champion tell you in response? I want to show you. Hopefully you guys can see this. I'm gonna hold it up. Can can you all see this? Let's see. That's me and Muhammad Ali. Where's my mother? <laughs> we can't that is because of your screen drop. Your it's my off. screen. Back up. I don't know if you can see it, but it's it's me, Muhammad, and my mo and my mother. Maybe you can see it here better. I don't know. Nancy, did your parents live in Turnberry? 
Uh, that was my father and my stepmother who lived Jerry. there. Jerry. Yeah, Jerry. Jerry. He was a friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, He lived there for a long time. Yep. Yeah, you got your palm tree is going to hit you. You might want to get that fixed. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, so you end up playing, you know, we grew up, there was no professional league. It's not a place we thought that we would go. The WBL happens. You play for the Dallas Diamonds. I remember that. You didn't play long, though. You were in. You kind of were out. Two years. And then, and then what happens? So I came to Dallas, um, and, oh, my gosh, my press conference was embarrassing. So, you know, like, I'm straight New York. How I talk like this. How you doing? They give me a white cowboy hat, and I'm, they're like, Nancy, you know, we're really happy to have you. I'm like, they said, do you know anything about Dallas? I said, yeah, I know everything about Dallas. I watch Bonanza all the time. I like, you know, Lil Joe is my favorite. And you should just see the media. <laughs> They're like, what the hell is here? And so the next day, I get a phone call from this guy. And he goes, Nancy, um, I go, yeah, who's this? How'd you get my number? He goes, my name is Roger Staubach. I go, Mr. Hail Mary, how you doing? It's so nice to talk to you. <laughs> And he says to me, like, I'm very young and very whatever. And uh, he says, you know, Marianne and I would like to have you to come over our house for dinner. And on every Sunday, like the Cowboys, we play basketball. We'd love to have you. And I'm like, so you're going to invite me to your house? Like, you know, I'm not going to steal anything. Like, you have your Heisman Trophy there and stuff. And he goes, we didn't think you were going to steal anything. I said, well, I'm from New York. And people think that we're going to take your stuff, but I'm not. I, I might eat a lot because I get hungry. And he's like, oh, my God, I have got to mentor her. And to this day, we've been friends. He's been just so kind to me and just shined me up because I, uh, I was not a shined up stone, stone in 1980. He did a good job, though, Nance. He did a real good job. That and ESPN sending me to elocution school in 81. That was the, the, the big you know, change in my life. I was articulate. Well, um, let, let's talk about the game a little bit. How about that? Well, let's start like let's 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 be in the here and now. Um, NBA, WNBA, watching a lot of games. What are you thinking? Well, I'm really proud of the players. You know, I stay in touch with a lot of them, and I'm proud of them um, because they're. They're so much better in a sense than we were because it's a different time. It's a, it's a different generation with social media. That they have a voice and it's okay to say what you feel. Now we might not agree on everything and that's okay too. And but I want to know, Renee Montgomery, what are you feeling? I want to know what you're thinking. I want to know what makes you happy, what makes you sad. LeBron or Rondo or the guys that, you know, even when Kobe was alive, you know, I had 20 years with, with Kobe and I would always ask questions like, do you, do you think you're being treated fair? Are you for equality? I remember asking Kobe this question one day um, prior to a game, he was coming in the arena. We sat and talked. I said, Kobe, equality. Okay. Let me throw this at you. How much do you make this year? 30, 40, 50 million. And he just looked at me. I said, I'm for equality. Let's divvy up your money one fifteenth of every player on your team. And Kobe goes, bullshit. I'm out there at four in the morning working out on the track, in the weight room, getting up a thousand shots before practice. And some of my teammates are just coming in. He goes, no, I make more money because I work harder. And I put myself in a position to win and to be successful. I was like, Lisa, okay. but, Lisa, but Lisa Leslie didn't think that Kobe worked harder than her. She, he th she thinks she worked as hard as him. No, she didn't. She thinks she did. Well, you know my she, point, though. Let's, let's assume that she did. Let's, let's yeah. assume that she did. Where's equality? Well, equal, equality takes time. I mean, you know, when did women start voting? When, uh, when were African Americans? Hundred years ago. <laughs> exactly. It, it's you know, it seems like forever that you know, uh, you know, still today, like black women yeah. on a sliding schedule, uh, they they make 60, between fifty-eight and sixty 
67 cents on yep. the dollar yep. to men. So we don't have true equality. We also have red line districts. We also have lenders that would give a white middle class family a loan, but an upper middle class black family they will not give a loan to. And so much of it is our leadership. I'm telling you, our elected officials, I, I, I don't want to say 100%, but they don't care about us. They care about money, they care about power, they care about their agenda. And they pander to suburban women, they pander to the black community. As I told Stephen Jackson after George Floyd was killed and he made those comments about you know, Jewish people in a very anti-Semitic way. And I called Stephen and I said, Stephen, I'm ready to have a conversation with you. And what, I, what I'd like to do is talk about you know, why the black community and the Jewish community, we should be thick as thieves. We're, we've had two of the biggest atrocities in history between slavery and you know, the Holocaust. Why is it that we can't work together? And matter of fact, after slavery, one of the things that was pretty amazing is the Jewish community really befriended the black community and helped with jobs and helped with business and, and didn't treat them as second class citizens. So, I mean, I have these conversations, you know, with Ice Cube as well, you know, who's my boss in, in you know, talk about, you, you would never yeah, think- Let's, let's clarify for everyone. He owns the Big Three League, right? Yes, but you know, I mean, he's 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 an, the iconic rapper, entertainer, um, entrepreneur. He's one of the brightest, most incredible people I've ever been around. It's an honor for me to say that I work for Ice Cube because we can we can get on a call, we can talk, we can sh you know share how we feel about certain situations, and then he'll say, you know what, you're my spirit animal. And I always say, that's good, right? And he goes, yeah, you know, we, we are one. And that's I appreciate great. him saying that. That's great. I mean, that's important, right, to make those kind of relationships. And you've always been great at that, Arnie. Yeah, so Nancy, let's touch on a couple points that you raised. Um, we've spent, we've, we've in past show, we've talked about some of the divide between the African-American and Jewish community from, you know, from, from Stephen to Ice Cube to others that have made statements. And then, other African American statement, Kareem and and uh, and others have made statements in a different way that have, have been more positive. How do we bridge that? Because we all know that there's a historical alliance. We know that our you know our communities may be the most um, you know hated by same groups in the history of our country. How do we bring them together? And then the other thing I want you to touch upon is. With everything going on in the bubble, which I think Don and I, and we, we agree with it. It's, it's amazing the messaging and the role that are being played by the NBA, WNBA players. But how do we make this not a moment that passes us by? How do we make sure that what happens today is going to actually have meaningful impact for the next year, 10 years, and beyond? Well, history will tell you that rioting, uh, protesting and messaging has not changed anything over the last 30 years. Uh, I do believe in, in freedom of expression. I do. And I don't think anybody, if you're conservative, if you're radical left, I, I don't have a problem with you expressing yourself. Again, I don't have to agree with you, but I, I need to hear why you feel a certain way. So I think What's going to be most important is actionable items, actionable uh, change. So, uh, you know, because as we shared, and I won't really go much on it, but I've been on these, you know, uh, governmental calls with trying to write legislation uh, to, you know, maybe change the language. Uh, body cams today has shown America what we've never really wanted to see. I, I really don't think every police officer is a bad human being. Uh, I, I think there is a culture that is tried and true. And I don't think the, the culture is to the police officer standing next to him. It's blue on blue. And blue on blue is like if you're in the army, your allegiance is to the uniform and to the flag. So culture starts at police unions. 
and you know not hiding evidence. Uh, if you know uh, if somebody has 19 offenses uh, throughout a 19 year career, and you you can't have them in Minnesota, you move them out, but they're still in the system. And I think that's where there has to be change. There has to be language to qualified immunity, but not take stripping qualified immunity, or nobody will protect your home. You know, even, even in Seattle, you know, for the people who didn't want a, a wall or the people who don't want the Second Right Amendment, what did we see on TV when they were doing that chop zone? They were moving barriers to build a deterrent, call it a wall, call it plastic horses, call it what you want. They didn't want certain people in there that they didn't vet or think was, you know, uh, beneficial to the folks there. There were, there were guys with submachine guns. So, you know, I was joking, oh, good. Oh, look, there's a couple of Second Amendment guys there, you know, tongue in cheek. But everybody, it, it, it's whether you're for these things or not, we have to make change. We have to get rid of red line districts where, you know, and I don't know if some of you even know, you should look up red line districts. It's, you could have little TJ who lives two blocks, you know, from little Jamal. And Jamal's territory has been pre redlined by government, local officials years and years and years ago before you, Arnie, before me, Donna, uh, any of us. And that's low income. So the tax dollars that they get from that, that go into better schools, better equipment, better technology, better teachers, they don't have this. But four blocks away, little TJ is in a suburban community where everybody basically has jobs and they, they pay their taxes. So they have better schools and better substitute, better volunteers, better equipment, better computers. And these people only live two, three, four blocks away from each other. It's a, you know, the dispar this disparity issue is real um, and should be made more evident to all. If but the financial, you know, Donna, the financial uh, institutions, they have to make- Absolutely. The yes, world absolutely. runs absolutely. on money, okay? Absolutely. If anybody says the world doesn't run on money, they're full of crap, okay? Uh, actually, I had a talk with Billie Jean recently and she said it about 27 times in 30 minutes, it was, I got the message, but no, we don't, we, we, we agree. We totally agree. But can I, would you mind if I ask um, some of these questions from some of these folks? Absolutely. Because we don't have you for many more minutes, if that's okay. All right. This is from Eric Amkrow. He said, Stephen Jackson was a guest in our home when I was training him in advance of his entry into the NBA draft. I found him to be a respectful, open-minded young man. So I was disappointed to see his comments when Deshaun Jackson made his statements, but he's appreciative to you for trying to build a connection and correct some mis misconceptions. Stephen Jackson is a really wonderful human being. He's worked hard. He had the world in his hands after, you know, his, as he called twin, you know, George Floyd died and he, he just was on the front line of respect and, and making under people understand it. But, you know, you just, it, it's like, you know, people go, please, President Trump, don't hit retweet. You know, it's almost like he retweeted, you know, made the same mistake. And then oh, he lost all of his credibility. And he's a really good guy, but you have to watch what you say and be thought out because, you know, the people paying you this money, some of them just, it's, it's okay. Like I don't have white guilt. I don't have any white guilt. And, and do I have privilege? Yes, I have privilege and so does LeBron and so does Michael Jordan and so do you. And so anybody who's rich, who's famous, who's an athlete, we're going to have some level of privilege. It doesn't mean we have to be assholes. It, it, it doesn't mean we can't be thankful. But if with what we have, I mean, me coming from nothing to where my life is now, I mean, I am more than happy to give millions of dollars away to charities and to help the black community. And for me, with th this platform we have, what I would like to see, and I know Adam, you know, sat down, Adam Silver, with the players, you know, uh, last week after the Bucks uh, boycotted, and that took a lot of guts, and I applaud them. But how about this? How about if all these 
athletes, black athletes, white athletes believe in the cause. Why don't you go back to your communities and say, I'm pledging 5 million, like Drew, uh, Drew Brees did. You know, he's, he and his wife just gave 10 million to the community. Yeah, the owner, of the, the owner of the Nets just did 50 million, 5 million yeah. a year for 10 years. But what I'm saying is the players who have had this extraordinary wealth, and especially the black players, the African American players, right. who have made hundreds of millions of dollars. Let's, let's do this together in partnership. LeBron, I, I love what he did with Promise School, by the way, and he's done it. I wish all the other players uh, as well, and some have. And then we go to white America or corporate America and say, let's match and let's go in in partnership because you don't want segregated black America and you don't want segregated right. white America. You Only 13.5% of America is African American. Correct. We all need each other. We, you know, lift when you rise, help people. You know, it's like I tell people all the time, hire somebody that doesn't look like you. And if they screw up, fire their ass. But give somebody that doesn't look like you a job. Sorry, Simone, uh, I lost my filter. <laughs> That's okay. we, have another, we have another young girl on the, on, on the call too, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. But are you just called yourself a young girl? Not me, I said there's another one, another I know, I'm just And if Simone's a young girl, and then we're gonna to talk to Addie in a couple of minutes. Go ahead, okay. Arnie. All right, well, Nancy, I'm gonna stay in this theme, but a quick shout out to, uh, I saw in the chat, Addie Topolowski. Uh, Addie is a young girl from, uh, I think she, Addie lived in the DC area, but from New Orleans with your dad. And you just stood up um, uh, in order to, to stand up for, for uh, female athletes and what the sporting goods are doing. So just a, a quick shout out to you for, you know, for being brave and taking the right stand. Nancy, look, you talked about people giving back. You know who gives back? Nancy Lieberman. Because uh, I've seen it with my own eyes. You are amazing. Your philanthropy work, your foundation. Um, talk a little bit about your dream court. I you you're, oh, you're I love at ninety. That's a good I one. I love at, the dream court. You're at ninety now, which is unbelievable. And your dream ball, and I saw you just gave out ten scholarships to kids to go to school. So, Nancy, you're doing amazing work. Talk a little bit about it. Well, you know, uh, thank you, um, Nancy Lieberman Charities is everything. Those are the pillars of things I either didn't or did not have. But the scholarship, we've sent 70 high school seniors to college since 2012. Um, the, it, we've given over 2,000 you know, iPads and, and laptops, laptops to kids in high school because you know, we want them to be on a level playing field with technology. Um, we're just now in the process of buying over 1,000 hotspots because there's kids right now with virtual learning because of the situation with COVID where they can't even get online in their house because they have such low Wi-Fi capability. So now they can't even get on those virtual Zoom calls. They're locked out of it because they don't have high-speed Wi-Fi. So we're trying to identify what the problems are, uh, everything from, from backpacks to school supplies, and that's gonna change. We have to be nimble. and but. You know, as I said, and this is cold, hard cash, we've given almost $7 million since 2012, um, predominantly to the African-American community. And now we're thinking about every year taking uh, 10 to 15 African-American uh, girls and sending them to historically black colleges so they can have pride in these institutions. And we, we just, we're not one and done. We don't just give you money for college. We give it to the bursar's office. Uh, every semester, you have to follow a first responder, a cop, uh, EMS, a community leader. We have government um, uh, learning programs. We have STEM programs connected on every dream court. And you have to shadow somebody each semester for a minimum of four hours. And that person in that city all over the country becomes a mentor to you. So you get a chance to go, wow, police officers are not that bad. Um, you know, the dream courts, we, somebody said to me, I was in a meeting with Microsoft and they're like, where is, uh, do you have artificial intelligence? I have, you know, I'm like, let me tell you what I do have. <laughs> you I have said, artificial intelligence, Nance, come on. There, yeah, I get it from uh, TJ. 
But he said, well, what do you mean? How does this fit? And I said, what's the biggest thing that you guys do right now? And they're like, STEM. I said, I was STEM before STEM happened. And all these people looked at me and they said, okay, how? I said, I'm a critical thinker. I understand inertia. I, I, I know the science of basketball. I know math. I hit a two, then I hit a three. My foot was on the line. You take a point off. I get three shots in the foul. I go, I know time, score, possession in my head in real time as it's going. To build a dream court, I know the engineering of every basketball court that we build, the depth of how we have to anchor it, how big the courts have to be. I said, I am STEM. And my first year coaching in 1998 in the WNBA, Lynette Woodard and I did a video. It was angles, it was arc, it was inertia. It was, we, we did a video in 1998 before anybody knew the word STEM. So, so we, you were STEM, you were STEM. Let, STEM. Me ask, let me ask you this, Nance, um, because you are in a very unique position. You have coached men and women at the highest levels, right? Both professional, I don't, you're right? Yes. Um, and at this point, I think you're, Maybe the only one. No, there's probably a couple others. Tell me any big observations and the difference in terms of the athletic approach, the mindset. Well, yeah, you 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 do. My dogs are going to bark. Sorry, but you you do have to understand that men six foot nine, six foot eight can cover more space than a six foot two female. So you have to be aware of how you're going to set up your defense and now the game you know we're in that that flow game and you know the ball is moving there's a game happening on the right side of the floor with you know three players there's weak side action which is usually where the ball is going to end up you're just trying uh you know rick carlisle is the master of deception trying to pull you know in basketball we play elbows boxes elbows nail if I can manipulate the nail guy, if I can get that guy who's like the center fielder or, you know, the free safety in football, if I can move that guy off the nail, uh, the nail I can disrupt your, your offense. Because all we're trying to do is we're trying to get, you know, eight or ten eyeballs looking at the ball with all this false motion and movement. And then the minute you turn and start ball staring, we reverse it. Where, you know, you dribble with intent to drive, you kick it. Now we want a one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on, -one on the weak side. So it's, it's really a beautiful thing where the game is today. And it's, it's allowed all kinds of players. You know, you very rarely have a traditional on-the-block post. Like when, when Reed and all those guys were playing in, in our, you know, Walt Bellamy and Wilt, even with Kareem. So it's, uh, it's pretty unbelievable to be a part of that. And they care. I have had the pleasure of coaching some of the most incredible human beings, like men, like Rondo and DeMarcus Cousins and Rudy Gay and Corey Maggette, Catino Mobley, uh, you know, Big Baby Davis, who's big, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, and then, you know, players, you know, Cheryl Swoops and people like, uh, Hall of Famers like that, you know, WNBA stars, they all have passion. They all care. And, you know, we, we, meaning you and I, we still have so much gratitude that this thing didn't just pass us by. That's true. And, and Donna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, and I think you know the story well. In, in 1983, when did David Stern get the commissioner's job in the NBA in the early 80s, right? Okay. I think. The, the, the WBL up. folded. Correct. And I was called to New York by David Stern. He might have been the commissioner for a year. And he closes the door in his office. You've been in that one, you know, a hundred times, thousand times more than me. And I go, like, sir, why am I here? And he says, before I'm done being commissioner of the NBA, there's going to be a W. And I went, what are you talking about? He goes, I am going to start a WNBA. I said, you're kidding. He goes, and here's my only wish. My wish is that you'll still be around to play in it. And you know, you're 23, 25, whatever I was. And I'm like, what do you mean? Of course I'm gonna be around to play in it. You know, you don't, 25, you don't see yourself at 39. 
It took, him 13, it took him 13 years from that point to do it. But he, he had this incredible vision and he, he looked at somebody like me and he goes, so fast forward 13 years, that first day when we played in America West in Phoenix and, you know, the, the national anthem is being sung. And that morning in my, in my home, my apartment, uh, Tim says to me, and my husband at the time, Tim says to me, Nancy, you have a phone call. I'm like, I don't want to talk to anybody. He goes, you want to take this call? It was David Stern. And he said, I'm so proud of you. I didn't know if you were going to make it because I was now 39. And he says, I just want you to know that I'm so happy for you. And it just, he had, his voice was like quivering. He was genuinely, you know, David, he was this tough guy, but David, David would push you in the deep end of the pool and you think you're drowning and he'd hold you down a couple of times, but then he would stick his hand in when you think you're dying, he'd pull you out. Sometimes. <laughs> That's a great. Not, not always Nancy, but yeah, sometimes. <laughs> that, that so, is that is a great story, though, Nancy. That really—that is a great story. You never shared that with me. You never yeah. shared that. That's an amazing story. Like 1984 was when he became commissioner. Hey, Nancy, really can we can, can, like, can we stay on basketball just for a second? Obviously, you were, you know, you came into the WNBA. The, the year it was uh, it was formed in in uh, '97, and you were you were the oldest player, I think, then when you were when you were drafted. But I want to I want to bring you forward 11 years after that because I think that story is. So unbelievable. And my co-host was the, right, Donna? Was the esteemed yeah, I, president? I, I, actually had, I, I actually had to sign off on this. I like, yeah. right? They came to me and said, you know, Nancy wants to do this. And I'm like, whatever Nancy wants is fine. So it tell wasn't me, me, guys. It was Lambeer. You know how it happened. And, 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 <laughs> and not everything with Lambeer is fine, but it was fine for this, for sure. Well, he, Donna. Approached you, he approached you the year before, right, Nancy? And said, look, I'm going to get you into, I want you to, I want you to play for me. No, the, 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 what the true story is, okay. we're playing the All-Star game in, in Washington. Yes. Um, this, they have the skills challenge. So ESPN yeah. said to me, hey, can you run through the skills challenge before the players come out? It was like two hours or so before the game. And I'm in my, you know, TV clothes. I take my little, you know, pumps off. And they said, okay. Go. So I shot, I got it, I, you know, I did all the, and I came back and somebody goes, that would be in the top five times in nylons. <laughs> and I was like, really? And I didn't know that Lambeer was like sitting in the corner of the arena. So he walks over to me and he goes, hey, you still play? I said, yeah, a little bit. He says, you want to make history? And I was like, what are you talking about? He says, when do you turn 50? I said, July 1st, next year. He says, I'm going to sign you. You're going to play at 50. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Really? So I didn't, I was getting in shape. I knew for six months it was going to happen. So I was getting in shape because of the respect. I'm in Dallas. We take TJ to Six Flags over America for his birthday. We're at a restaurant and we're watching the Sparks game. And all of a sudden, the, the fight broke out. You remember, Donna, the fist fight? I do. Okay, I'm watching it, and I'm looking, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm playing for Detroit. <laughs> and somebody goes, what are you talking about? I'm like, four or five players are going to get suspended. Late that night, Bill calls me, and he goes, you got all your stuff? Can you, can you get to, we'll have an airline ticket. Can you fly to Houston tomorrow? And I was like, yes, sir. He goes, you won't have any practice. I said, just give me one or two things that you guys run. And I, I get there and shoot around and TJ was down there with me. And he was, he was amazing. Bill was great. Bill was great. He, I know why his players and coaches love him. He is so protective. And he would, he would not let anybody like come at me or why are you doing this? And I'll never forget my 48 hours, you know, with him. And I really appreciated um, what he did for me and what you allowed to happen, because you could have said no. 
But why? It was a good thing, right? It was a good thing. And, it, for, and for anybody that wants to go watch the video, because Nancy has a no look pass that uh, that was rather amazing. And uh, I mean, it's just a great moment, I have to tell you. And the, the, the crowd, you know, and it was just a great moment in professional basketball. So, you know, for anybody that's interested, definitely go look at it. And, uh, and uh, Nancy, special for you to be able to be in that position. Well, you know, what's funny is I went back to my real job like that Monday and I flew to LA because we had the, the Laker game and I was doing sideline for ESPN and Van Gundy and, and Jackson and uh, Mike Green were, were there. And we finished interviewing with, uh, with Phil Jackson and I'm walking down the hall and this guy goes, hey, Nancy. And I go, hi, Kobe. And he goes, you got like 10, 15 minutes? I'm like, yeah. So we sit in a room and it was like being in a think tank. Kobe's like, why'd you do it? How'd you feel? How long did you train? What was going on? He, it, it was unbelievable, the questions. And I said, Kobe, you're the MVP of the league. You just won you know, the championship game. And you're asking a 50 year old white woman what she was doing, what she was thinking. And that's when he started calling me the mama mamba. And I told him what Ali told me when I was 19, you know, um, respect everybody, but fear nobody. And that's what I've lived through my whole career. With a minute one to go in the first quarter, we have some people in the arena standing up because Nancy Lieberman, the Hall of Famer, is now in the basketball game. Lieberman, you got an assist. Assist for Nancy Lieberman. How about that? A little razzle dazzle over to Sonny to assist for Nancy Lieberman. We appreciate uh, what she's done for women's basketball in the past. And uh, also, uh, they want to see her get out there. So they are. Our players had a good time. Had, had a nice That's so great. Yeah, that, that was so, I'm so glad you guys had that clip. It's so cool. And Nance, you know, you, you brought up Muhammad Ali. We should mention because this was such a cool thing for all of us. He used to come to the games in Arizona um, with his wife, Lonnie. And it was so thrilling every time he would show up. And he loved the game. And he loved the women, you know, who played the athletes. It was great. That was really great. He was, uh, you know, so I met him at 19 and we had, you know, four decades of love and kindness and everything he meant to me, calling me when I was in college and staying in touch. You know, when I was trying to come in, uh, play in the WNBA, you know, at 39, I called him. I said, what do you think? Hey, girl, you got to do this. Nobody comes out of retirement more than me. <laughs> and, and That's so funny. It, it, that is really funny. Funny how that's a full circle. But my first, okay, the second person in July of 2015, when Vladi Divac called me and said they were hiring me as the assistant coach of the Kings, TJ was in the gym with me with Del Harris at, here in Plano. The next person I called was Mohammed and Lonnie. And I'm like, Lonnie, Lonnie, is, where's Mohammed? Can you put this on speaker? And Mohammed, she's like, Mohammed. And I said, they just hired me. They had been telling me for three, four years I was going to be coaching in the NBA. I was like, yeah, okay. It happened. And so um, I said, when we play in Phoenix, will, will Muhammad come to the game? And she goes, we will be there. So we play in November. This is amazing. He's in the suite behind the King's bench. And I'm trying to be professional. You know, it's my first gig in the NBA, but I'm so nervous and I'm looking up there and I'm blowing kisses to him and he's waving to me. And, and somebody, it could have been DeMarcus. Somebody goes, yo, you know, the, the champ is here. And Rondo goes, yeah, it's coach's friend. And all the players, it was the greatest street cred I could have ever had from the Suns to my team. Everybody's like, you know, Ali? You're, yeah, I'm like, yeah, he's my lifelong friend. And they, they took pictures. He was great. He was amazing. And then a few days later, I'm doing something, and Kevin Durant comes to me, and we, he goes, you know Ali? I love Ali. And I go, I'm going to give you Lonnie Ali's cell number. <laughs> you and Lonnie can work this out, but when you go to Phoenix, and I, you should have seen me with Kevin. I was like, you go by yourself if Charlie, your brother, wants to go but do not bring a posse. That's right. You're gonna stay for a whip. You can take pictures. And I was so protective of Muhammad, but I felt so happy to set this up. And then Kevin called me and he goes, greatest moment of my life. 
Yeah, he was incredibly special. And Lonnie, Lonnie is still so special and all that. Listen, we are running out of time, if not out of time. But let me, I just want to, two quick things, Arnie, and then you, if you want to pop in here. One, I got a call from uh, a woman that works with me, one of my colleagues, and she goes, Donna, you're not going to believe this. I have this little cousin, and I think Arnie mentioned it, and she was at the store, and they didn't have the sneakers. And then she told me the whole story, and her father got mad. And I'm like, wow, that's terrible. But well, good for her. The next thing we know, there's, a, there's an article in the, Wall, uh, the Washington Post, which, by the way, it's posted in the chat. You guys should click on it. It's great. So um, then she comes to me the next day. She goes, would you talk to my cousin? I said, I'd be happy to talk to your cousin. Would you do this? I'm happy to do that. And I see the article in my text. And all of a sudden, Mackenzie, our producer, sends me a note and says, Donna, the girl in the Washington Post is, I'm like, and I, I never realized whatever. So Addie's here, our Jewish sixth grade basketball player, Addie Topolowski, who let the world know, she used her voice, right? We're all about using our voice, Addie, to let them know that, hey, and I, I want to let you know, in my closet, I still have Diana Taurasi shoes. It always made me angry. Not that they paid LeBron $90 million for his own shoes, but that we never had our own shoes and that I was marketed to to wear his. And I didn't want to do that. And Addie, he, um, she let the industry know, much like that young girl did with, um, you know. Steph Curry. Right. Much yeah. like with Steph, that like, hey, listen, we're here. We're consumers. We deserve something that's made for us. So Addie, thank you for being with us. I asked her if she wanted to ask a question. And she said, no, thank you. She's just happy to be here. So Addie, thank you for being here. I'm waving to you right thank now. Thank you, Addie. That's awesome. Way to go. Um, somebody commented that Bill Lambier was the dirtiest player you ever saw. Yes, he was. But I have yes. to tell you, um, he was fantastic yes. to me. He was like, if I, if I want to talk about business, if I want to talk, I, and like, he was a pain in the ass. Totally. Sorry, girls. But he was. But on the other hand, I just, I was grateful to him and for him. He, he was, he was one guy. of the biggest advocates for women's basketball before Kobe. He was on the front line and, you know, he was an assistant coach in Minnesota and he ended up leaving because he wanted to come back to the WNBA. And I, um, I will always applaud Bill Lambeer. He's a winner in everything he's ever done. Look what he's done with the Aces this year. I'm just proud of him, but I'm proud that he's been so vocal about how great women's basketball is. I, you know, and he has been, and he's back in, in Las Vegas and he's doing a great job. Steven Berliner, Berliner, Berliner. I think it's Berliner. Berliner, Steven oh. Berliner. Yeah, he's on, by the way. Hi, Steven. There you go. Been All right. Time. There you go. Uh, Artie, you have a closing thing and then I'll wrap us up? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's been a great evening. You know, I, there's so much we didn't even get to. I, you, know, you know what I really wanted to ask you, Nancy, with your competitiveness, you played for the Washington Generals and I have it like in my mind that in the last, in the closing seconds of a game, you're down one and you're gonna, you're supposed to lose, but you're gonna steal the ball from Mel Lark and go dribble it and, and, and uh, win the game. To, you know, breaking that all-time record with the Globetrotters. But we'll cover that on, a, on another show. I, I think we have to do, definitely have to do Nancy Lieberman part two. We do. We have to do part two. We have to do part but two. We have to do part two. It's been a great evening. Nancy, thank you for joining us. Uh, your story is remarkable. You do incredible work. And, uh, you know, all of us that know you, we're honored to, to call you friends. And looking forward, Donna, to our, uh, our next show and, uh, and beyond. Absolutely. Thanks, Nance. And uh, as I said, before everybody got on, I saw Nancy in January. And she goes, I have to talk to you. I'm calling you tomorrow. So this is Nancy's version of tomorrow. And oh, no, you I, know what I, I hope our next call will not take this long, but we should it catch won't. up. Thank it you won't. so much for sharing as you did. We really, really appreciate it. We're proud of you. Really Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. And um, I will come back. Okay. Awesome. Hey, listen, Thank you so week, much. No problem. Next week, just so you know, we're talking minor league baseball. We have two fantastic guys. Skip Bertram, which many of us may know, uh, he was the 1999 head coach of our Pan Am baseball team. But more than that, he was also a, an Olympic coach. I believe he won a gold medal in the 88 Summer Olympics. He was an assistant. Um, he's amassed 870 wins. So much more about Skip. He'll be joined by another favorite of mine, um, Ken Babby. Ken Babby worked at the Washington Post, actually, worked himself out of there and became the owner of two minor league franch uh, franchises, the owner of the Akron Rubber Ducks and the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp. 
uh, both AA minor league baseball teams. We'll have a lot of fun talking baseball next week. We know that you'll be uh, join us on behalf of M MUSA, led by our president, Jeff Buchanan. And I think, Jeff, I, I think I saw you here tonight, our CEO, Marshall. I definitely saw Marshall and his family. Our amazing producer, um, Mackenzie, thank you so much for doing such great works. And Dan, thanks to Steve and Shane. I saw them. And of course, Don Kent, who tonight, we didn't even get to ask you any questions or ignore Not you. Not a single Don. thing. <laughs> I'm telling you. All of our volunteers and officers who are doing great work showing how sports truly is such a vital social and life-changing force. Um, you know what? We've never done this, but we think it's probably a good idea to um, remind you that if you want to support this program and others like that, our athletes will be gathering soon to go to Israel for the Maccabiya in 2022. Two. Yes. Um, there's a text to um, donate if you are interested. It's in the chat. Mackenzie will put up a link. We'll see you in two weeks. Arnie, you're just the best. The work you do is great. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. And everybody yeah. else, bring your friends. Come on. Thank, Thank you, Dad. Love you. Great. Have a good, have a good week, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you.